probably most weirdest uh, talk titles that I could have come up with. And before I explain that a bit more, um, let me start with a thought that I have for quite a time now, um, which I can't get out, out of my head. Um, I'm thinking that the social web as we know it today um, is based on a rather fundamental architectural design mistake. A design mistake that has been made when the read-write web was born, and a mistake that probably has not been made on purpose or out of any evil interest, but that probably just happened. And what I'm talking about is the core principles of how we store user-generated gener data on the web. Nowadays, when we share a picture, a video, or a comment somewhere, um, we just accept that the site where we want to share this on does that for us, and we don't think about the underlying architecture. It just goes somewhere, so in some kind of magical cloud, hard drive, database kind of thing. And connected to that, um, we have all become digital schizophrenics in some way with uh, split identities. So in order to link to our data and authenticate and be able to edit those stuff and share those stuff, we have to cre create accounts over and over again. And so we need uh, some sorts of digital schizophrenia managers like 1Password, which help us keep track of all those accounts, all those credentials, emails, password, uh, passwords that we have connected to it. And my digital identity is split across 145 different accounts, so I'm quite a mess. And let me um, make it even clearer how absurd the situation really is. Let's just imagine that there would be an operating system based around the same kind of uh, architectural principles. An operating system where each application would get its own partition on the hard drive, a closed down black box which the application can write to and read from, and which is completely locked down so as a user you couldn't access that uh, file storage, only the, the application could access it. And also you would need an account for each and every application that you install on your operating system. And in order to get some work done, you would need to log in over and over again with all those different accounts that you have for each of those applications. So I think it's easy to imagine how crappy such a system would be from a usability standpoint. <laughs> it took me quite a while to find that picture. Huh? <laughs> 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 that sounds like a great product, right? So here starts my little experiment for the day. Um, because I want to take you to a different universe. You have to follow him. It's so, such an amazing account. <laughs> I want to take you to a parallel universe, uh, a universe which contains a parallel version of our planet. With the same size, same population, same people, same everything, except that they uh, went for a different kind of architecture for their social web. And the idea for their social web is that users should have just one account connected with a place where people can store they, their data that is going on the web. And it's pretty similar to what we have with email, actually. With email, we have an identifying address, which is connected to an email inbox, where all the data gets stored that we send and receive. And so the idea for... Um, their version of the social web is that each user gets their own domain, which is connected to a data box where they can store all the data that goes on the web. And getting started with their version of the web is pretty much like getting started with our version of the web. I will still remember when um, we got a modem first at home, um, I still remember that the first, one of the first things I did was to get an email address. And um, so people get their domain when they connect for the first time. Most people actually already have one from their ISPs. So when you sign up for an ISP contract, they give you some kind of generic, ugly subdomain of, yeah, of their main domain. And so they also give you, included in those contracts, a data box where people can store things on, pretty much like we get what we get with an email address. 
And of course, you have the same kind of choices, so you can also <laughs> select uh, some kind of crappy uh, alternative provider which will provide that for you. Or if you care a bit more about your personal identity, you can spend some money on it and get your own domain, just like we can, and get your own data box somewhere else. And the data box itself is based on open protocols and open standards, pretty much like email as well. And it's not bound to any provider, so you can take it from one provider and put it on another provider, or you can even self-host it um, at home or in some data center that you trust. And so what you get there is a combination of your identity and a place to store your things. And pretty much like we know from Dropbox, um, it's connected with all your devices. So you connect all your mobile phone, your computer, and everything with that data box and with your personal domain. And the data box will keep in sync with all those devices. So when you put files, on there, uh, put files there, they are going to be synced. And everything that is stored on that data box is identified by a URL. So you have all kinds of URLs for the different kinds of things that you store there. And in order to control who has access to what kinds of files or folders, you can use a similar system to what we have on um, Unix-based systems. So um, you can just give other data box owners um, access to certain files and folders, or you can if give entire groups access to certain files and folders. Again, pretty much similar to what you have with Dropbox. And those data boxes connect. They are not only made to connect your devices, but also to connect with each other. So you, when you give someone access to files on your data box, those files will be synced as well. So again, pretty much like what you have with Dropbox. And so around this idea that you have some place where you can store things privately, um, the data box also serves as a place where you store your um, contact details, your personal information about yourself that you want to share on the web. And that can be split into different kinds of um, subversions. So you ha might want to share a different kind of set of personal information with your friends than you want to share with um, personal, uh, with, with like um, coworkers or um, your business network. And so what happens with their system when you make those connections is that you give um, the other guy that you made the connection with a connect, uh, part, access to the part of your identity that you want to share with them. And so automatically, over time, an, uh, ad um, an address book gets formed. And that address book is updated whenever someone on your, connect on your network updates something. So when a friend of mine changes their mobile number, it will automatically get synced because I'm connected with them. And also, with those connections, what you build is your own version of the social graph. On our version of the social web, not only our identity is split and fragmented, our data is fragmented, but also our social graph is somehow fragmented. I think most of you uh, still remember the times when we all have been on StudiVZ, or some of us have been on StudiVZ and tried to connect there with different kinds of people. And at some point, StudiVZ died out, which was a good thing, and people moved to uh, Facebook. And so, since those platforms haven't been compatible, we had to recreate our social graph again and connect there with the same kinds of people. And that happens with any other social platform as well. So with, if I go to Twitter, I have to find friends again there and connect with the same kind of friends that I already found on Facebook. And for them, uh, their social graph grows with them, so they take it wherever they go, and it grows with them over time. So when you start in school building your connections, you still have those connections later. And similar to email, when you think about email, it's quite amazing how deeply integrated email is into everything that we have um, concerning computers. Um, there is hardly any system that is not somehow um, built on top of the idea that you can send or receive emails. So um, it would be unthinkable that there would be an operating system that would not have an email client. And so with my little vision for their parallel universe, um, the same things would, hap uh, would, would happen, the same things happened actually. Um, that system of personal domains connected with the data box are deeply integrated into every kind of um, OS that you have. And so when you set up a new computer or a new mobile device, you also can connect it directly with your personal identity on the web. 
just like you can connect your Twitter account, for example, nowadays on Mac OS X or like iCloud or like Google Drive or something. And here is where it becomes exciting because that means that those con that a connection can be shared across everything that is installed on your um, on your computer, for example, because the operating system already already knows about it and just has to give it away for other applications if you allow that. And so on planet Earth, um, social the social web has um, started to be integrated into all kinds of applications um, and all kinds of native applications right from the beginning. So for example, an application like iPhoto just shows your social graph and shows those friends that you have connected with and that have um, given access to their kinds of photo libraries. So can, you can browse their photo libraries actually uh, inside of, um, drop of, of iPhoto. And as well, personal communication gets possible. So you can instantly start to communicate around your pictures with your friends. And that um, communication is being stored um, with, together with images. And so I just, uh, let's just come up with the idea that there is a similar standard to EXIF that just stores all those kind of stuff. So that's pretty much how it would be, how, how it would work. And so you, if you think about it, if our native applications have access to your personal data that is going to the web and your social graph, um, a lot more things get possible in the interaction between applications. And around that, um, standards for file formats formed in a similar way that we have those standards for file formats um, for ages. So we somehow always accept, uh, expect that uh, when we edit an image in Photoshop, that it, this kind of image is also compatible with any other um, image editor. And so on planet Earth, let's just pretend that um, to do apps, for example, um, built on the same kinds of file formats. And uh, so if you switch it to do app, it can still access it to do and things like that. So what you come up with this is like a developer's candy store, um, a system that is so deeply integrated and um, open that anybody can plug into it and get awesome things like um, offline first uh, support out of the box, what, what Ola just talked about. So for example, what the application would really just need to care about is where to store those files. Just like when you put um, support for, for Dropbox with your, uh, in your application, um, Dropbox will take care for the thing for you. And connected to that, um, the rise of client-side web apps also started much earlier. Because um, there was much less need to find um, to build complex backends which handle things like user authentication um, for, uh, for the app. So what you get is just some kind of uh, front-end library which you can use to access that data store of a user that comes by and use that to write or read files on there and, and data on that. And so the identity handling on planet Earth went into the browser because you just have one identity which is also connected with your operating system. So your browser al uh, also gets the identity from the operating system if you allow it as a user. And this is where um, lots of possible things, uh, of things get possible which are not possible for our web because we have those um, split identities. And so what a site simply can do if it wants to um, learn something about the current visitor, like for example, about the address, um, it just has to ask for it and send some simple request for the kinds of credentials it needs from the user. And what the browser does is to come up with a pop-up and say, okay, this site wants to request some stuff from your personal information. Do you want to give it to, to that site? Do you trust that site? And so a lot of sites that are based around the idea um, to create a user account in the first place on our version of the web uh, would not need to create such a user account in the first place. Because think about some, something like ordering a pizza, where you have to create an account just to make it more easy for you to uh, order a pizza next time. Um, such sites could simply just ask for the address any time you come by. And then there's something connected to, the, to that idea that is also much easier to handle 
um, if you want to store something for the user right now, that you want to persist until the user returns for the next time, um, you can either go for a session or store things in, the co in cookies, or you can create an account again and keep things in a database for the user. And so many um, sites built around this concept that they want to give some kind of comfort to users well, with um, remembering what the user has entered. And with such a system that could just ask for access to such a data box where you write things like, for example, um, some settings that a user has set on your website, um, and the user can allow that, um, you can easily have device-independent sessions without creating an account for the user. So every time the user comes back on different devices, um, it would still be connected to the same kind of data. And more than that, that data would also be stored on that data box, which means that the user could even look into those files and see um, if it's okay what the site stores for him. And that means that things like simple wish list applications in shops or simple scenarios where the user wants to store them, stuff like this um, would be very easy to build, actually. I think um, many of you probably have already been part of the WhatsApp dilemma. Um, many of my friends have been using WhatsApp for quite some time, so um, for sending Im uh, emails, uh, sending all kinds of messages, sending Im images and things like that. And so you're somehow stuck with um, using it as well because yeah, your friends do and you somehow want to connect with them. And people didn't think really about how uh, WhatsApp is going to send uh, to, stay, to store all those messages and how um, they will take care about security and encryption and things like that. But suddenly, when they got bought by Facebook, um, many people um, searched for alternatives be because suddenly they got concerned about their privacy and about Facebook taking all that data and analyzing it, analyzing it somehow. And you could see many um, different applications pop up alternatives for WhatsApp. Um, things like Threema, I don't even know how to pronounce them, um, or Telegram, and other applications in the same line. And of course, they all um, somehow try to convince users that they are better than WhatsApp is doing, and that they are more secure, that they are caring much more about encryption and all those kind of things. But basically, what you could see there was that all those alternatives suffered from the same kind of issues because um, what they all had to do as well in order to get this communication between users somehow sent is to store this kind of stuff on, on servers which they provide. And so we are always left with such, in such uh, situations, we are always left with the problem that we have to trust someone. We have to trust them that they really um, do what they describe on their homepage. But if you think about uh, a system and a web, a social web where everyone would have their own place where, where you can store data, uh, those messages would never have to be stored on some other server because messages could be stored on your server and be stored on the servers that you sent the message to and end, in, end, in, end, in, oh my God. <laughs> end and end encrypted between those um, servers. So the dilemma wouldn't be there for them. And if you um, think about possibilities that a peer-to-peer -peer network offers. There's a lot of awesome stuff that you can do. And talking about trust, on planet Earth, it also would be kind of difficult to trust um, the pro provider that you are currently running your data box on. So especially when you go for some free, cheap provider um, where you can't be sure that they take um, backup seriously or that they keep your stuff pr private or what, whatever. And so, um, in such a situation, the network could take care of, of itself by just simply building its own backup system, a peer-to-peer -peer backup system. And so what it does, it takes your files and it splits them in, in, into tiny little chunks and encrypts those chunks and sends those chunks across the network redundantly multiple times. And so on each data box, there would be a small space reserved for backups from other users. And you, you couldn't do anything with those chunks. They would be useless to you. But for the others, it would be a multi, multiple redundant backup system that would come out of the box. And such a backup system could even have a social component, pretty much like uh, with torrents, where you 
get better uh, download rates when you provide better uploads and things like that. So um, when you provide more space for backups from other users, you will also get more space for your own backup. I think what we are facing with, the, with our social web is something that we hardly think about. Um, and that's um, another problem of, of the architecture that is built upon. If I'm sitting here in Düsseldorf at a table and someone is sitting next to me and I want to send him an, an image and I use something like iMessage or use something like Facebook message, um, that image will go across the Atlantic and probably end up somewhere in California and from there will be pushed again back to the other guy next to me at the table. And that's kind of weird. It somehow reminds me a bit of um, catching crab in the North Sea and then sending them to, to the Niger to clean them. It's somehow a, a little absurd, but it seems to be the easiest way to solve those kind of things. And it's also, of course, um, it makes it much easier for those services to actually control the data that they send or what they can do for users. But that um, comes with an issue when it, when it comes to new architectures for, um, future web, for the future web. So if you think about uh, mesh networking, and mesh networking is actually a huge thing and which is super exciting. Um, the architectures somehow collide and um, are not longer uh, compatible. So mesh networking is built into iOS 7 currently and also built into Android as far as I know. And it's, it's a very ex exciting technology where um, the devices can build their own um, webs. So all our mobile phones could build up their own web, which is not connected to the, to the internet at all. And so this means that I could go with a f group of friends to some camping trip to a remote forest somewhere without any internet connection, and that we could still use our mesh network to send things and share pictures and things like that. And if our private network would build, be built around the idea of being a peer-to-peer -peer network, that would be compatible with such a mesh network. So um, our peer-to-peer -peer network could be reflected on our mobile devices. And those mobile devices could know from each other and still keep exchanging images. And as soon as we return from our camping trip, um, that changes would be synced with what we have online. And that's another thing connected to the social web, which is somehow problematic, um, which is the Internet of Things. Um, I think the Internet of Things will be something that we will see in the very near future, as, which is already there, which many pr um, companies work on and offer um, products which are already um, ready to be bought and integrated in our homes. And it's a great idea to have all those sensors around us, all those different kinds of helpers that make our home smarter. So when we come home, we can actually um, decide that um, on the way home, we want to have lights on everywhere or the oven is already switched on and things like that. But the idea of having sensors all around you which are connected with each other and also connected with the web get instantly super creepy when it is about um, when something like Google buys Nest. And it might be some kind of paranoia, but um, the last year has showed that there is actually some reasons for those kind of paranoia. So um, personally, I would never um, add, add those kind of sensors and devices to my home if I knew that they would be connected to Google, Apple, or whatever. It's worse enough that we have all those um, mobile phones, computers that can be used as spy cams and microphones and things like that. So I think the, our current structures of the social web are somehow um, offering new kinds of problems for new kinds of innovations. And for a long time I have been thinking um, when I started getting int interested in, in decentralization and the idea of a more open web control over your data, etc., etc., et um, all I read was theories how to replace everything on the web uh, with a decentralized architecture. And so I was part of those kind of thinking for a long time and I always thought, okay, we have to uh, replace our social networks with decentralized uh, solutions and everything um, that is currently centralized has to be gone until a talk from Repu Republica just lately from Michael Seemann made me realize that, that 
might not even be necessary. And that's an awesome talk which you really should look when you have the chance to, yeah, watch it if you have the chance to. Um, and what he's talking about is the issues that are connected when you want to replace some certain um, services with a decentralized um, network because you have things like transactional costs um, which makes it more complicated to um, to query things on a network. So, for example, if you want to, to do a simple query around your network of friends um, for, for all kinds of images and things that people have, um, those, that search would, would also ha would always have to go through the entire network and search for all kinds of data, which, which would be extremely slow. Um, and so he comp he, he, he's pointing out how um, some si uh, situations are not actually reflectable with a decentralized structure in the same kind of way so that it would be convincing and fast and, and super easy to use. And that made me think that um, social networks are not necessarily a bad thing at all. What we want is to share some kind of stuff with everyone or with a huge group of people. And the web as we have it today, is based on the idea that we can see all kinds of things um, collected from all kinds of sites, and so there's nothing bad about that. And when you think about a combination of decentralized uh, structures, like such a peer-to-peer -peer data network where everyone is storing and care taking care of their own private data, it's com completely compatible with the idea of having centralized uh, solutions um, in, in addition to it, to solve those things that we want to share with everyone. So for example, sites like Flickr or sites like Instagram would still work around these ideas. And you could still give them access to your public images that you want to share with everyone. That would be no problem, and you could just give them access um, to your data box and it would fetch it from there. And the, the huge difference is with what we have currently is that we have much more control of what we actually want to share with them. So. They don't have to create an account for us. They, we don't have to uh, store a password with them. Um, we don't have to, to store all those, those private things that we store there uh, nowadays because this is what they try to do. They try to, to solve all those different kinds of things, even the private ones that we might not want to share with them. So you probably might wonder, um, where, why, um, why am I speaking about such a strange vision of a web that is not what we currently have, something that is not there, that has not evolved in that way, and that is probably never possible? Quite obviously, we cannot change the past. That's, that's a matter of fact. Um, but this scenario, the scenario that I've just come up with is not just my idea or something that I made up but it's a combination of many uh, different scenarios that people are th currently thinking about. And um, when I started to research um, around these ideas, um, I actually find, find, uh, found out that people started to come up with different kinds of architectures for the social web very early in the process. So um, many people had the same kinds of thoughts that we need some more um, um, a better uh, system for our identity, a better system for our personal data. And so projects like OpenID formed around this. And there is even an article um, from Tim Berners-Lee from 2010 who is writing about pretty much the same kind of concept, a combination of WebID, which is um, a project the W3C is still working on, which solves this kind of identity crisis problem, um, connected to a personal data store. And more recent pro uh, projects are, um, for example, um, remote storage that is based on that idea, or uh, uh, the Tahoe file system, which um, solves the idea of distributed file system. So it's not just something that I made up, that many people um, come up with for a long time. But the problem that we have with decentralization is that we, have, we don't have a success story yet. All those projects, um, mostly are either uh, not ready yet or they failed in the first place. And that has led to a situation where um, decentralization for the web is dismissed b before even thinking about it. 
But I believe that we can change the future, and I really believe in that. Um, otherwise, it wouldn't make sense to, to go on anyway with what, what um, we are currently doing. And so um, I think if we give decentralization another chance and think about the potentials, there's a lot to learn from. And a lot is connected to the idea that the social web that we currently have is limiting us, limiting us in inno innovating and coming up with new concepts of interaction and new kinds of uh, of the web, because the web as we define it now is not just um, this omnipresent thing that, that yeah, is about us uh, all the time. And I feel that the web community is somehow stunned at the moment. Um, if you think about all those revelations and scandals from last year, which are still um, being revealed, um, nothing is really happening. Well, maybe not nothing, but um, I feel that many people actually think that there is something that we need to do, something that we need to change in order to have more control of our privacy, more control of our data. But people somehow feel to be in shock because all those scandals seem so huge and um, all those structures seem so huge and so overwhelming. But I think we need some kind of resistance to that. If we accept the status quo and we just go for it and say, okay, yeah, we messed it up, let's just, let's just keep it like that, um, we are somehow actually fucked, in my opinion. Um, because what we need is um, a web of choices, and that's actually what it's all about, about being able to, choice, uh, to choose your provider, to be able to choose where you want to store your data, the, the, ch uh, the choice where you want to uh, to, to, to what you want to share with the web and with the public uh, people on the web. Because otherwise we will uh, have the same kind of issues with, different, uh, with only just one haircut or things like that. So. <laughs> and we somehow have to realize that this is not about compromises. Decentralization has this strange connotation that it's always combined with um, being less easy to use, being complicated, being technically um, it's much harder to solve and all those kind of things. But there are actually a huge number of projects which, which show on a, on a small basis that it's, it, it is working. And just because Diaspora has not been a success as a social distributed network does not mean that the idea of decentralization is not working. And so in order to achieve that, I think we have to start making alliances. Um, <laughs> mm. Because this is another problem connected to, to decentralization, unfortunately, that uh, there are uh, lots and lots of projects out there, open source projects, all kinds of teams working on ideas. And most of those ideas are not that far away from each other. So they mostly circle around the, the same kinds of concepts, around distributed data um, file systems, around identity, around peer-to-peer uh, -peer messaging, and around all those kind of things. And it's kind of sad to see that um, every part of that community is somehow trying to come up with their own solution. So I think we need to start to make alliances in order to, to um, gain more power and move forward faster and more quicker and show people that this actually is something that we can do and which, is, which, is total, which totally rocks. Um, you can check out all the projects I've been talking about on redecentralized.org, and that is a great site because what they are currently trying is to collect all those different kinds of projects and showing what their current status is. So if you are interested about this topic, um, go there and check the list. There are lots and lots of awesome ideas that you could make many, many, many different parallels, uh, parallel universe visions of. Um, some, um, let me get to something more personal. Um, I haven't cared myself about decentralization for a long time. I have run a bookmark service which um, was yeah, based around the same, the same idea that people sign up there um, for many years. And until I somehow fell into some kind of um, depression, some kind of professional depression, when I thought, um, okay, it doesn't really seem to make sense to work for this kind of web anymore. And that might be personal situation, but um, what I felt is that it's 
almost as uh, attractive to go drilling for oil as to working for the web at some point uh, last year. And so I gave a talk in October, and people came to me and said, that talk was pretty good, but um, I'm totally depressed now. And so <laughs> at some point, I thought, OK, let's just get over this. Uh, depression doesn't make sense. And sometimes it's good to, to listen to some Metallica and um, cheer up a bit, because actually, um, there is some new kind of challenge that I see in decentralization, and that is to come up with new ideas that nobody ever thinks about at the moment, coming up with new projects, meeting new people, and maybe this is something that could be awesome for you as well. So if you um, feel in some kind of the same um, situation, or you can relate to these ideas, um, I can only encourage you to, to join us, for example, on the decentralized camp on Wednesday, or um, just join us in general, join the community, and help us build those kind of alliances. And Mark came to me and said, uh, Ola was a bit, uh, finished a bit early, uh, take your time, <laughs> and now I'm, yeah, I have 10 minutes left, and still want to leave you with just one last quote, um, which keeps motivating me currently, and probably will be keep motivating me for quite some time. The next big thing will be a billion small things. Thank you.